All right, well, welcome back to another tutorial where we'll be looking at the process of creating a set of PBR textures, specifically in the context of working with trim sheets. So we'll be hitting two different categories here. We'll go through the process of manually authoring um, an albedo map, uh, roughness, metallic, and uh, a normal map as well. Um, I mean, there's, there's other PBR maps we could use here, like an, like an AO map and that sort of thing. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll stick to the, these four uh, types of PBR textures in this tutorial and uh, create a trim sheet out of them. And then uh, closer to the end, we'll take a look at the idea behind using this uh, single trim sheet to actually texture multiple assets. So actually what I'll do uh, just to get a bit of a visual for what we uh, kind of our end result here is I'll pull up my render view. Uh, this is the trim sheet I created uh, for this tutorial. So I'll be Kind of going through the process that I used to create this, and uh, we can see what we've got here is uh, just some. Uh, I, I'm going for some hard surface sci-fi metallic details, pretty simple uh, as the theme. Uh, but we've got these uh, just applied to a plane, um, and, and what I can do as well is pull up the individual PBR maps used to accomplish this. All right, so here's the albedo, so just base color or diffuse color information. Uh, this is the metallic map or metalness. Um, I'll probably be using those terms interchangeably here because Maya or, or Arnold refers to metallic textures as metalness. Um, so, right, so, so black uh, meaning a metallic value of zero, white being 100% metallic. All right, so we're We'll, we'll, we'll simulate uh, some kind of, kind of me metallic parts uh, on, uh, on the surface and then kind of some painted, uh, uh, some, some painted parts as well. Um, we can see like the, the darker areas here on the albedo map, right? Those would, would correspond to like kind of some, some darker paint on, on a metallic surface, right? So uh, there is there's the metalness map or the metallic map. Got a normal map as well, so we'll be uh, modeling some geometric details and baking that all down to a normal map. We'll actually do this all inside of Maya, so we're not going to need uh, any any other software to uh, to do this. Just just Maya and Photoshop. We'll do this all as manually as possible, so that you can do this uh, without Substance or uh, or or anything or, or Marmoset or anything like that. Um, so there's the normal map and uh, finish it off with roughness, uh, just uh, showing, it, uh, sh showing some, some variance in, in the uh, amounts of roughness, right? Like, for example, I can point out this, this idea of this uh, painted portion where we've got like a dark paint on the metal. Uh, we've got a higher roughness value, so uh, the, you know, that, that surface appears a little bit more diffused than the shinier, uh, metallic parts, uh, but we still got uh, plenty of roughness variations. You know, even even on the metallic parts. Uh, you know, showing areas where well, maybe there's some dirt in there, uh, or 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 something like that, right? So so there's uh, there's the four textures that we'll be working towards together. These form a trim sheet, and uh, actually let's let's just uh, finish off this first section just by quickly talking about. You know the, the idea behind trim sheets and what exactly they allow us to do. So uh, let me go ahead and hide this. I will bring in my individual uh, modular uh, pieces here that I created. And in fact, uh, let's go ahead and just render those out quickly. I was working on kind of a little sci-fi uh, bunker modular set here. I just created uh, a few quick elements which snap together nicely, um, but the the real uh, the real point here was using the trim sheet to texture uh, all of the assets, right? So uh, actually, let's there we go. Lighting isn't the best here, but at least we have something to look at. Um, the, the idea being that we're using a single, uh, you know, basically a single, uh, a single trim sheet uh, and applying different details from that trim sheet 
two uh, different assets um, to texture them, right? Obviously, you're not going to be doing this for a hero asset where, you know, an, an artist is going to be putting in a considerable amount of time to, uh, you know, really detail one asset really nicely. Um, but this is a great way of saving uh, on well, the, the number of textures you need to load into memory uh, to optimize a real-time product uh, a, a little bit better and well, just, just have multiple assets. Uh, I either have like one complex asset using, uh, you know, lots of repeated details from a trim sheet, or in this case, as we can see, well, multiple assets using, uh, again, following the same idea and using uh, different details from the trim sheet uh, to well, fully texture the entire thing. And what I can do here is uh, actually head over to my UV editing view. I'm going to jump up to my perspective here and frame in on, uh, uh, on these assets. Let's just take a quick look uh, at, uh, at some of the UVs here because it will be very important to note and, and, and to keep this in the back of our minds that, well, these assets are not going to be UV'd in the, well, the, the traditional sense of, uh, of, of how a single asset should be UV'd, right? Uh, think back to how you originally learned how to UV map uh, an asset, right? You, you'll, you'll probably be thinking about well, having having non overlapping UV shells and, you know, having well, obviously having every, everything in the zero to one space and all that. And, and we can see here that we are not uh, really following those rules. Um, let's let's well, I, I think actually this is a good example. This uh, kind of this cylindrical elbow joint on a a, a kind of a tunnel component of my modular bunker. Uh, set here, we can see that, well, there are lots of overlapping UVs, and there's even uh, one part, uh, this is part of the, uh, part of the cylindrical uh, component here, which even extends outside the zero to one space. So, so why are we doing this? And why is this okay? Well, and, and, and again, this is uh, generally related to the game development scene where we are trying to uh, uh, very frequently trying to optimize things as well as we possibly can. And, well, like I said before, uh, make use of the same texture to uh, texture multiple elements uh, instead of having to store, well, a, a higher resolution texture for uh, this, this asset itself. So we, so we can have, like, you know, non-overlapping UVs and have, uh, you know, basically every polygon with a dedicated uh, portion of the texture uh, corresponding to it. That is not happening in this case. We are overlapping UVs all over the place, right? Uh, we are, uh, let, let's, let's select uh, some different components here, right? So maybe this top cap of the cylindrical part right here, um, this, this requires the texture found kind of in this blank space up top here. Um, how about, uh, how about this this cylindrical section down here? Well, that that looks good with, uh, you know, maybe maybe I'll pull up the albedo uh, just just on its own so we can kind of see what part of the uh, what part of the texture is being applied here. Right, that's this part kind of right down here with the red painted strip and uh, the kind of some some uh, grunge and uh, you know that, that sort of uh, texture in the the background there. And um, yeah, so, so we can see there's, there's lots of overlapping going on here. We are, uh, we are basically um, optimizing our textile density. We have a lot of, we have a lot of uh, uh, information present in the trim sheet. And we are, you know, whenever possible, we're, we're using details over again so that we don't have to, you know, have those details present in the texture in separate areas and therefore reducing the overall text textile density we have to work with. Um, so by, by overlapping UVs, we're reusing details, allowing those details to take up as much space on the trim sheet as possible. Now there's one other thing um, that I want to draw everyone's attention to before we get going on this, and that is the fact that um, the, the, the trim sheet itself should 
uh, horizontally tile. And, uh, you know, that's going to be important for um, components like this cylindrical piece right here. Now, I suppose technically uh, we could actually bury a seam in the, this, um, uh, you know, intersecting geometry. Uh, but, uh, well, one of the advantages here is, is because, because this trim sheet tiles horizontally, well, I was able to scale this out um, as, as much as I needed to to get, well, uh, to, to, to get uh, the, the, the number of, in this case, it was these red stripes here uh, that I wanted uh, visible on the model. Actually, maybe I'll have another render. Yeah, I have another render uh, pulled up here, right? So, so for, for maximum flexibility and for the, uh, the freedom to tile as we wish, um, you're going to want to make sure that your trim sheet tiles, you know, at least horizontally. Um, generally, there's no need to uh, make it tile vertically as well. Um, but again, that's going to be dependent on the situation here. Um, in, in this case, horizontal tiling worked uh, just fine uh, for my purposes. All right, so, so that's a quick look at uh, the idea of trim sheets, what they are, how we're ultimately going to use them. And so let's get started actually building one. All right, so uh, what I'm actually going to do here is uh, switch over. I'm going to switch over to another file where I have the uh, geometry that I baked down to a normal map here. I'll just switch my view over to the classic workspace and turn off the UI. Um, so, so here we go. This is, uh, you know, hand model geometry. And the, the goal here, and this is generally a good starting point, especially for working on sci-fi, you know, kind of hard surface details like this. Uh, you know, start from the most important elements. Start from the actual geometric shapes you're trying to represent on that texture. So uh, let's let's just take a quick look at this. Um, well, first and foremost, I have kind of like a a fundamental uh, 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 plane just kind of underneath everything, such that if I if I just want to have uh, a part of the resulting normal map. Uh, with with just just a flat surface, right? As we can see up on the top here, there is no normal map details right up on the top of my normal map, right? Um, then, well, I can just I can just allow this underlying plane to show through, and well, it'll it'll bake down just fine. But then on top of that plane, I've got a whole bunch of geometric details. Let's see here. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll start at the bottom here. And I'll just uh, kind of separate out uh, a few pieces, All right? So these these are the panels that we saw uh, at the at the bottom of the normal map. It's actually the same pattern, uh, just repeated, and just repeated four times. So I mean, it it does actually tile quite nicely, um, but uh, you know, pr pretty straightforward to do. Just a simple modeled shape, um, you know. One of the the easy um, tropes of uh, of hard surface design, right? The beveled edges, right? Really easy to introduce here, and they do show up quite nicely on the normal map. So, uh, so we got going on there. And well, let's actually just undo that real quickly. Put those back in their places. We can explore a few other details we created here, uh, like this uh, horizontal piece. And that's a separate island of geometry. Uh, and actually what I can do is uh, just quickly duplicate this object. And uh, let's see, this is a negative 100 centimeter uh, translation there. We'll get this uh, perfectly positioned uh, right, uh, you know, as, as a, uh, as, as a, you know, as if we were uh, viewing this as a seamless texture. And so we can see that it does tile perfectly. Go to our top view. And uh, I mean, we can even we can even turn on our wireframe on shaded just to see that that, you know, that lines up perfectly. So uh, that was an important consideration for 
uh, that component right there. And something I even end up doing is like we see on uh, uh, this component up here, um, I just kind of left some extra geometry hanging off the edge. You know, it doesn't matter as long as uh, as long as this is tiling correctly and positioned properly. You know, we've counted, you know, how many of these um, you know, studs are going to be um, are, are, are going to be present here. And well, you know, maybe it's mirrored over properly or however you choose to do it. As long as it lines up correctly, it doesn't matter if geometry is hanging off the edge of your high poly object. You know, when this is baked down to a uh, to a to a to a plane, uh, that extra geometry will be uh, removed um, and it'll it'll continue to tile properly. Right. Um, so, so there was that. Uh, and there were a few other things here, some cylindrical kind of like piping uh, look, looking objects. Maybe I'll Turn on wireframe on Shada just to help us out with with uh, visualizing some some other details here. There was this groove that I uh, modeled in here, so that's kind of kind of a, a fun detail. And then uh, the rest of this stuff, and of course leaving again, like I mentioned right at the beginning here, leaving this empty area, uh, an, an area with no uh, normal uh, no normal uh, baked detail, um, just to offer that surface type when texturing your final model. And I, I knew I'd, I'd need that for various uh, parts of the uh, these sci-fi bunkers that I was creating. So I made sure that that was in there as well. All right, so uh, again, this is a bit more of an intermediate tutorial. I'm assuming here that uh, you know, you're comfortable with modeling. So um, you can go ahead and create whatever geometric details you deem necessary. Um, again, I've I've kind of showed the different uh, the different sorts of things I modeled here, and the next thing we're gonna do is bake this all down to a normal map using Maya. And again, one last uh, quick check to perform uh, before you bake this down to a normal map is again pretty much what I what I did just a few moments ago. Um, you're gonna want to make sure that this tiles properly. So uh, you know, duplicate your geometry. With this one to positive 100 units, right? Um, uh, and and you're going to want to you know take take a close look at this, render it out, check it, you know, get a nice specular highlight bouncing off of it, make sure there's no um, you know tiny imperfections in the geometry right where the seam is. Take a real close look at it and make sure that it is indeed seamless. And when we're ready to go, uh, let's. Get rid of those uh, extra pieces here. When we are ready to go, all we need to do is go ahead and make uh, a plane which matches this uh, right our our high res geometry uh, in in dimensions exactly. Right, so uh, I'm gonna go uh, I'm gonna go right ahead here and add in a new plane. We don't need any subdivisions on that. Um, so so there it is, a tiny little uh, unit plane there. Now, I happen to know that uh, this high-res geometry uh, was 100 uh, centimeters by 100 centimeters, so I'm actually going to uh, set up those dimensions in the input node. Right, so there it is, a, a new plane which, which matches our high-res geometry exactly, and I'm going to leave it uh, right underneath uh, the, uh, the 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 high res, right? And in fact, it it is in fact uh, overlapping that kind of uh, base plane that I had uh, on the uh, the high res geometry itself, right? So that, that's okay. It can just sit there, just overlapping. Don't move it. Uh, just just let it sit there. Um, we can get rid of our construction history. We don't need that. And uh, let's let's just go ahead and name things such that uh, we can easily find these when we're doing our uh, normal map bakes. Now, I mean, I already had this labeled as final because it is the final uh, form of my geometry, but uh, we're going to want something uh, something telling us that this is the high-res version. I can label my low-res here, trim geometry low. Very low-res, right? A single quad. That is uh, about as low as it gets. All right, so 
there we go. We are uh, ready to uh, bake uh, the 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 ge- geometric details down to a normal map. Our UVs are already set up and ready to go. Uh, we can we can see that in the UV editor. Right, this plane comes with default UVs. It's projected properly. Takes up the entire zero to one space. So our resulting normal map bake will look just fine. That's good. Um, all right. So so let's go ahead and um, uh, let's go ahead and get that normal map. All right. So under our lighting and shading menu, under transfer maps, we are going to be able to set up our uh, bake. All right. So let's get our target and source meshes set up here. So um, our target, well, target is already set to. See, can we get that full name in there? I don't think we can. Um, uh, well, let's just let's just clear all and do it ourselves, right? So I'm gonna have my trim and geometry low selected, add selected, right? So that gets inserted into the target meshes, and then for source, right where are we bake in the the details from. Well, we are taking the details from the high resolution mesh, right? So I'll have that object selected, add selected. We got those in there ready to go. And we are, well, I'm actually going to remove all of these options. If you're doing this for the first time, you're not going to have any options there. So let's just make sure we have that all cleared out. And I'm going to be baking a normal map. So we'll select the normal option here. Um, and uh, well, let's just real quickly uh, 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 assign a location to save this normal map to. All right, so we'll make sure that is set as a PNG image. We'll use PNGs for this tutorial. Um, so, we, so we've got that in there. Uh, we're going to keep uh, this, this setting set at tangent space, baking in tangent space. Um, and then under Maya common output, we're going to need to uh, make sure a few things are set here. So I would recommend for this tutorial to actually bake out a 4K normal map. Um, we will get nice crisp results doing that. We'll have a lot of flexibility on uh, what we're able to texture and how we're able to use the trim sheet if, if we work with everything at 4K. Um, and then later on, you can always scale that down to maybe 2K or something like that. Keep in mind that Maya is extremely slow uh, with baking high resolution normal maps. So uh, what I'm actually going to do to uh, just save a bit of time here is I'm going to bake at uh, 1K, so at uh, 1024 by 1024 pixels. Now, I would actually recommend starting by doing this. Uh, you know, you don't want to be waiting for the, you know, 20 to 30 minutes, no joke, that it will likely take you to bake a 4K normal map. Um, and that's from experience, no joke. I mean, uh, you know, on, on, on my RTX 3080, I was actually waiting longer than 20 minutes for a 4K uh, normal map bake. This is the inefficiency of Maya. This is why generally, uh, you know, as, as environment artists, you know, we don't bake normal maps in, in Maya. But this is the software we have uh, to do this tutorial with. So uh, we, we'll, we'll make do with what we have. I would highly recommend starting with a lower resolution test such as baking at uh, 1K. Make sure everything looks good and that uh, the, 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 the bake has worked before you invest the time uh, baking out a uh, larger image. All right, so there's that. Um, we're going to leave everything else as default. Um, again, I'd highly recommend you set your sampling quality to high. Again, this is greatly going to contribute to your bake time. Um, so. Uh, so I, I think this should work uh, in, in, within a few minutes uh, as, as a test. So I will set my sampling quality at high and I'll leave my filter, my Gaussian filter size at uh, three and we should be good to go there. Now, um, one other thing that we're going to want to take a look at here is the search envelope um, that, that is going to define, well, that, you know, you know what, what's the what's the area that we're going to be searching within to find geometric details to bake? Um, so what we can do, what we can do is under the target meshes, we can actually display under the display option here, right? Instead of mesh, we can turn on the envelope display. Now I'm not sure what the default setting here is. 
Uh, but it, it is possible. It is possible. Um, if, if your search envelope percentage is set too low, that, well, this, this preview of the search envelope for the normal map bake is uh, not actually going to encompass all the details, right? If this is set at one, notice how the red transparent plane is actually underneath, you, you, you know, the maximum height of some of those geometric details. This is going to, well, give you a bad normal map bake when you look at the result here. You're going to be missing some details because they were not considered in, uh, in, in, in the process of, well, you know, finding all these details and, and seeing what the, the eventual surface normals should be. So we are going to want to make sure that we increase the search envelope such that this transparent plane is above all of the details. So, well, that looks good. 3.8% works well for me. It totally depends how you've modeled your high resolution geometry. Um, so you're just going to want to make sure you take a look and set that accordingly. You can set that back to displaying the mesh and everything else is good to go. All right, so we hit the bake button and uh, wait a little bit. Again, hopefully this test will go quickly. Um, but uh, again, like a, a 4K bake is going to take uh, a fair bit of time. So you know, don't, don't force kill your Maya. Uh, you got to wait for it, unfortunately. All right, and uh, my, my 1K bake has completed properly. So there it is. Uh, there is my normal map. Now again, this is only, only 1024 by 1024. So we are seeing some very noticeable pixelation on some of those uh, small details. Um, again, you're going to want to do the, you know, at, at least a 2K, if not a 4K bake to, to get things nice and crisp. But um, this looks good. You know, I, I'm looking at all my details, comparing this to the geometry that I hand modeled and just making sure that everything's present, right? Again, if that search envelope isn't set properly, you're going to get a weird cutoff at, at a certain height and everything else is going to appear flat, right? So you're just going to want to take a visual look through here and, and just make sure that everything is present uh, the way you expect it to be. All right. So there we go. We, we've baked our normal map. That's, uh, well, that, that's one of our uh, PBR textures completed for the trim sheet. And uh, the rest of this is pretty much just Photoshop work to set up the other uh, textures properly. Um, and, and not going to lie, it is going to be uh, a little bit of, uh, you know, artistic trial and error, kind of going back and forth between uh, you know, Maya and Photoshop to get things looking right. Again, this process is streamlined in software like Substance or Quixel Mixer. Um, but if we're doing it just with Photoshop and Maya, uh, we, we can still accomplish really great results. It just takes more time. All right, so let's hop over to uh, Photoshop and see how we might approach this. All right, well, I've brought my normal map into Photoshop here. And again, this is my 4K bake. Um, so we're, we're, we're ready to go here and, uh, start creating some other PBR maps to, to really finish this off. Um, and you know, the, the order in which you approach this, uh, will vary depending on the situation for hard surface and maybe, maybe this kind of futuristic or sci-fi vibe. I generally like starting from the geometric details, which generally tend to be the most important part of the design. So of course those are, uh, represented very, you know, very, uh, clearly in the normal map. So I like starting from there and, uh, and then, well, may maybe sometimes approaching roughness next, or maybe, maybe albedo next. It, it kind of depends what the situation is. Uh, but you know, what we can actually do is, is just quickly visualize what this is going to look like rendered in Arnold. So let's actually do that real fast. Jump over to Maya. Um, you know, I just have a, an, M a, a plane uh, positioned right beside my my other plane with the trim sheet, the final trim sheet applied to it. So we can do an A B comparison here. I am going to uh, assign a new material. All right, we're going to look for our AI standard surface. I'm going to assign that to this plane, and that is very bright. It is uh, white currently, but this is what we've got going on here. All right, so we'll just be working on this. Uh, this blank uh, plane here and just building it up um, texture by texture as we go here. 
uh, just to see just to see all these all these uh, uh, PBR maps come together here. All right, so um, let's go ahead and open up the Hypershade. So rendering editors Hypershade. And there it is. So I'm going to clear my graph and actually let's give this uh, this new texture a name. And so uh, it's currently called AI Standard Surface 2. We can doesn't matter where we rename it. I'll, I'll just use this uh, this option right on the right hand side of my hypershade under the property editor. I'll just call this. I'll call it sci-fi sci-fi trim sheet material. Just so we know which one we're dealing with. Uh, that will be uh, this uh, this graph right up here. So right click graph network, and there we go. We can add in our normal map now. So to do this properly in Arnold, um, we are going to be searching for the AI uh, normal map node. So let's go ahead and add one of those in. Um, our out value is going to be going to the normal camera uh, uh, socket of the AI standard surface. So that can get uh, slotted in right there. And then we are also going to need a file node. Right, so there's our file and our place 2D texture. So let's just grab those, bring it down here. Um, our color is going to go into input. Make that a little bit bigger. Sorry, that's a little bit small on the recording there. But uh, all right, so our out color is going to go into input of the AI normal map. And under the file node, we can add in uh, the, the file that we're looking for here. So I'll quickly go and just grab that. All right, so. That will be my trim normal. So there it is. Let's open that up. And we are going to want to make sure that we set our color space to raw because this is not sRGB color information. Uh, this is this is this is raw color information. So uh, right, not not to be displayed as sRGB. So we need to make sure that is set. Very, very important. Um, it goes through the AI normal that node and into the normal camera socket of the of the uh, material itself all right so i'll just minimize that for a second here and uh well let's just quickly pull up the arnold live render you know what you know what let's select let's select the uh, ai standard surface material node itself and just dial back that uh albedo color value or the base color value uh, just a little bit, and we're also let let's also just as a starting point bring our specular roughness to about fifty percent. All right, let's get rid of that. Um, so now, and this is where I wish I had uh, both of my screens visible on the recording, just to make this a little bit easier. But we can make it work. All right. So, so there it is. There it is. Um, we have our normal details uh, present and coming through on the texture, right? So, so this is already looking great. You know what? We can even test out our tiling to make sure that uh, you know things are tiling as expected, right? We don't want to do too much uh, uh, more work if we need to go back and tweak some of the geometry to uh, fix any tiling issues. So. Uh, what I can do is I can just duplicate this and uh, I believe my scale is a little bit off in this scene as I was quickly setting this up earlier, but uh, I'll just uh, I'll just uh, translate this this plane so that it's sitting precisely next to the original one. And let's render this. It's going to be a bit slow as I am navigating in the viewport while Arnold, Arnold is rendering, but you know, zooming in nice and close on that scene. We want to be seeing no geometric artifacts. We want to see that that tiles perfectly. All right, so things are looking good. Uh, we can move forward and uh, start working on, um, how, how about we do the roughness map next, right? I, that's that's uh, usually a nice place to start. Uh, just seeing some roughness details come through. So, um, actually, I can 
you know what? Let's leave up the two uh, planes just like that so that we can make sure that we don't introduce any unwanted um, uh, you know, our artifacts or, or seams in the textures themselves, right? We definitely don't want to do that. So good idea to keep those, uh, you know, that, that tiling situation uh, up and uh, visible. In fact, what I'll do, what I'll do is I'll add one on the right side as well. So we get the full, we, we get both the left and the right side um, visible, right? So we can, uh, easily see if we introduce any tiling issues on either edge of the texture. All right, so over in Photoshop, we've got our normal map ready to go here. Let's do a bit of organization work uh, just as we get going. So we will drag uh, this, uh, this normal map into a folder. And so I'm going to call this uh, normal. All right, so all our normal information can go in there. You can add in another group here. Do a roughness uh, and metallic, or you can call it metalness, up to you. And albedo, right? Those are the four maps we are going to be taking a look at in this tutorial. All right, so we're working with grayscale values, right? Zero giving us, um, you know, no roughness, so a mirror-like reflection. Uh, one giving us uh, like full roughness, a, a fully diffuse surface. So let's uh, let's keep that in mind and just think through. Well, uh, where where exactly do we want uh, to be? Uh, you know, having having shiny areas, and where do we want more diffuse areas on this surface? So this is where I'm going to start making some initial decisions about. Well, okay. You know, I'm going to work with the idea of having, um, you know, some of some of the parts of these uh, the, these metallic panels painted and other parts not painted. Um, so, so let's, of course, as reference, I'll bring in, I will bring in my my roughness map that I uh, created for this tutorial. I'm going to put that in the roughness folder here, and so ultimately. I did end up deciding to go with, well, you know, about, you know, maybe, maybe that's around like 20 ish percent gray, um, for kind of this, uh, this, uh, basic, uh, metal underneath the painted areas. So, so what, what we would end up doing here, I'll just hide that, uh, real fast. Let's take a look at the approach that we might take for this. Um, I'm just going to start with solid color fills using the normal map as a guide. So I'm just going to do a big uh, marquee selection here. Let's 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 make that selection. I decided on about 20% gray, um, and I'm just going to make that color fill on a new layer. Um, and actually, that was Shift Backspace. I know. I, I usually, I, I don't know, I got my, my Photoshop shortcuts, right? So I forget where exactly in the menus that is buried, but I just do a quick shift backspace, fill with foreground color, and get those quick color fills in there. All right. So that's a great starting point. Let's see what else I ended up uh, going with here. Right. I ended up tracing out kind of the top surface of each of these uh, kind of extrusions on the panels, right? And so, so I, I, I just use a polygon lasso to uh, trace out those shapes and then did a color fill of a slightly brighter color to introduce more roughness, right? As if that was the painted area here. So let's uh, get rid of that. Um, Control D to get rid of my selection. Let's do the polygon lasso and uh, let's just, let's just, maybe let's take a look at this top area here. So um holding shift to get and get a horizontally locked um a, a, a line there right make sure that is nice and straight i'm just going to carefully go through here i'm going to do this fairly quickly because of course you're going to be pausing the tutorial and doing this all on your own time uh i'm just going to quickly go in here and get a selection and let's well let's Let's increase the brightness here. Let's get around 50% gray. 
uh, do a fill and I need to make sure that my layer is visible so I can actually fill on it and we can do that. You know what I also might recommend is when you're introducing new layers, you know, it doesn't matter what map it is, um, when you're introducing like a, a new layer for a, a new detail, I would suggest, you know, actually put that on a new layer. It just makes selections so much easier if you have to come back in later on and change the, the values on uh, for, for that particular layer, right? So I'm going to make a new layer here and do that color fill on the new layer. But that is independent, right? Otherwise, we'd be like using the you know magic wand selection or something uh, a little bit hacky like that to make our selections again uh, as we edit things in the future, right? So that is the general idea. And that is the general idea for you know making selections and uh, getting different values on there. And um, actually, I'll, I'll just pause the video and uh, you know do do a few of these details i'll come back um, and then uh, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of show like a bit of this process because really it is the same thing that you're doing for, for the metallic map and ultimately the albedo when you're putting on your uh, your base colors um, we're just going to be going in here doing our, our basic shapes and then you know painting in uh, more specific details you know as you can see i've got lots of uh, you know like little little roughness variations in this case where uh, well the, the paint has been like chipped away or, or weathered in some way we're going to want to be putting in lots of nice details like that even some uh, some details coming from like photo texture sources um, like this grunge on the background here and uh, just introducing lots of nice stuff to get this look looking uh, really realistic right so I'll be back in just a second with a few more of these color fills in and we'll just take a look at the process in context of the roughness map, which you can then apply to the other two types of maps. All right, so I'm uh, I'm back here with uh, these color fills in. Right, these are all still on a separate layer. Uh, what I'll do actually is just uh, let me select that background kind of more 20% gray color. I'll do a fill on the rest of. Uh, that layer just so we get a nice kind of baseline roughness for everything and uh, actually have something to uh, export out here. Um, let's let's uh, quickly pull this image uh, out of Photoshop. Let's get it into Maya, uh, connect it in properly as a roughness map and uh, just take a look at some of the initial results we're getting here. Right, so uh, quick export is PNG and I'm just going to, well, I'll save this alongside my finished roughness map as incomplete and uh, we'll just work from there all right so over in maya i'm gonna have to pull up my hypershade again and uh well this time let's uh, let's go ahead and add a new file node in um this right this this time the file node let, let's get the, the texture loaded in here first and then talk about another detail in just a second here um, so I'm going to load in, I'm just going to quickly go and grab my texture. Uh, now probably you should have a, a Maya project set up here and all your textures going into source images, but I didn't have that set up uh, to start this tutorial. Um, but I highly, highly recommend you do so if you're working on a larger project. Right, so there it is. There's my incomplete roughness map, just, you know, as we're, as we're figuring this out. Um, what what you're going to need to make sure is that um, we have this connected in properly, right? If you're adding in a roughness map, um, kind of from from the attribute editor, you know, you, you you may be used to adding in a roughness map, you know, by hitting the little checkerboard icon. I mean, you can do this however you like, um, but what you're going to find, and what you're going to find is that roughness maps automatically get added in with the alpha channel being connected into your specular roughness. Our roughness, map, our, our roughness maps are not set up to work this way. We are using grayscale values. And um, the, the specular roughness is only expecting a, you know, a, a, a well, single dimensional roughness value, right? a value between 0 and 1 to, to give roughness information. It's not expecting a color vector. So we're going to have to hit the plus sign right beside, um, right beside out color. And we're going to have to go ahead and grab, let me make this nice and large so we can see this all on the recording. 
my apologies for uh, for sometimes forgetting to zoom in there. But let's have this nice and large here. We are going to grab just one of the color channels, right? Of course, grayscale image, all the, the, the RG and the B channels all have the same values. So I'm just going to grab out color R, connect that into specular roughness. We're almost good to go here. The only other thing we need to make sure we do is the same thing we did for the normal map. And that is making sure that our color space on the file node is set to raw. Again, this is not sRGB color information. It is, it's just straight up values. Um, so we, we need to do, we, we need to make sure that is set properly for the correct um, PBR, uh, well, results, physically based results when we render this. All right. So, so there we go. We've got our roughness map loaded in here. Maya is going to go ahead and pre-process that texture. Or I should say Arnold is going to pre-process that texture. So it uh, will load in quicker uh, in, into memory for subsequent renders. And uh, when we hit play on the Arnold render view, we're going to start seeing some really cool results here. All right. So we are already seeing that uh, roughness map starting to work out for us. All right. So we've got the kind of that more diffuse um, uh, re reflections on the kind of the top surface, uh, the, the uh, extruded part of those panels, and the rest of it is still, uh, uh, you know, a bit more shiny. That's a great start. And let's, let's just take a look at the, uh, you know, some other details we can bring in here, right? Um, and, and really all I'm going to do is I am just going to uh, use my eraser tool on this layer right here. I'm going to select a nice, uh, a nice textured brush. It looks like this chalk brush is going to do uh, real nicely. And we're just going to start bringing in some nice kind of like uh, organic weathering details. Just, uh, you know, think, think about where uh, different, uh, you know, maybe objects may have brushed up against this painted surface and worn off the paint. Um, and uh, again, maybe it's just generally being exposed to the elements. Um, we, can, we can think through uh, how, how we might want to introduce some imperfections into the roughness map here and just start painting those in. All right? It would be a great time to pull out your tablet. I currently do not. My, mine is across the room currently, so I don't have time to pull that out. I'm just going to start bringing in some nice details here. Do take note that if you want to um, uh, start painting directly on the edges of your um, uh, of your map of your trim sheet, you're going to want to take into account um, th wh whether or not it still tiles correctly. So you're going to want to take care uh, that you don't mess that up. Uh, maybe I'll do a uh, separate tutorial in the future on um, just uh, making sure that uh, your images in Photoshop are still tile tiling correctly. Uh, so a cheap way, if you're just trying to uh, you know get get the feel for uh, creating trim sheets uh, manually, a cheap way is to just well, leave those seams um, without any painted details on them, right? So that they, you know, it's just a solid, it's just a solid grayscale value tiling onto the other side so that there's no issues introduced there. That's a cheap way of just testing this out. So maybe I'll bring in a more more noticeable detail I'll really really scrape off some of this paint and expose the shiny uh, metal underneath here uh, on on some of these on on, uh, on on this detail right over here I'm not going to go overboard I'm not going to go overboard uh, just bring in bring in a few things here bring in a few details on 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 some interiors as well the inside portions of these painted panels and leave it at that. All right. 
So uh, that's the general idea. Again, there is so much we can do here, right? And you take a look at the roughness map that I ended up making here. There's lots of, uh, lots of things that I ended up introducing, right? Um, such as, uh, you know, um, e even more shininess, right? Even, even uh, uh, sharper reflections on the beveled parts of these kind of extrusions, right? And, and, and showing those or, or kind of that, that, that shinier value um, through on, underneath the painted areas, you know, uh, being even a shinier value than kind of this base, uh, I guess, 20-ish percent uh, gray that we were using uh, originally. And I introduced some more details, you know, uh, such as up here uh, from, from a photo source, uh, just showing, well, what, what might be like some, some grunge, like some, some more dirt and grunge. Um, uh, that that was kind of underneath this uh, gr uh, this this kind of protrusion uh, along the top, right? Um, this is going to be a lot of going back and forth between Maya and Photoshop to make make sure things are looking proper. But um, we can we can achieve some pretty great results doing this. All right, so let's export this uh, this this roughness map out again. Now we aren't going to be able to overwrite our the, the the texture that is currently open in Maya. Of course, the file's open, uh, you know, in use by another program, so we're not going to be able to do this. Um, different software allows you to do different things. For, for example, in Blender, we actually can overwrite like the the the, the textures are closed essentially uh, by Blender, you know, after rendering. So we're we're able to actually overwrite and and have a bit more of a streamlined process. Uh, but unfortunately, with the way this works with Maya is what I usually do is just go back and forth between kind of an A and a B version. So maybe maybe I'll call this uh, uh, the, the B version or the second version of the texture um, because, you know, we can have one version of the texture open in, uh, in Maya and then overwrite the other one. You know, you, you could just continue to save, you know, version two, version three, version four. That is a good way of doing this as well um, but what we're going to have to do here is just quickly go back over to our file node and well go and find where, where is it T trim roughness incomplete b right the new version of this texture uh, load that up make sure that color space is set back to raw it does reset this value every time we load in a texture which is really annoying um, but yeah, as long as we make sure that is set back to raw, uh, we should be uh, back and ready to go here. Let's go ahead and get Arnold to render this scene again. And hopefully maybe let's take a closer look here and see if we can see some of those new details, um, starting to come through. They're a little bit subtle. I think we can see a little bit of a detail uh, where I was chipping away some paint there. Um, th they're pretty subtle currently. Um, if you do more uh, or higher contrast in the roughness values, you're going to see these come up uh, in, in a more obvious sense. But what I can do actually to fast forward to kind of the end of this process, again, it's going to be a, a lot of uh, kind of uh, artistic uh, trial and error, and uh, you know, have to get a feel for uh, what changes result in what rendered effects. But I'll just load in my completed roughness map here. Again, I'm going to set my color space back to raw. I do need to make sure we do that. And let's go ahead and render that. Um, so now, sometimes it's hard to see the roughness details maybe you know what i'm gonna do i'm gonna take my sky dome and just darken my sky dome light just so that uh, things we, we, we have the potential for a little bit more value contrast in the render Hopefully we'll be able to see some of these roughness imperfections coming through. All right, so there it is. There's, there's a nice one down at the bottom there. And there are uh, plenty of others as well.
All right, so there's a look at uh, at creating a roughness map. And again, as you know, as as reference, I can uh, just just show this again, nice and full screen, uh, as as a reference for you know maybe maybe some ideas you could work towards. Um, and uh, you know the 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 uh, level of contrast between some of these values. Again, remember that uh, you know black or uh, zeros in every channel is going to give you a shiny, uh, you know, crisp reflections, that sort of surface. And, uh, you know, 100% white, ones in every channel is going to give you like a fully diffuse and, and, and rough surface, right? So you can keep those values in mind as you're painting these in, you know, doing color fills, that sort of thing, um, chipping away, you know, uh, you know, er erasing things, painting stuff in, um, and, and adding in some nice details to the roughness map. All right, so so that, that's a look at this part. Um, from roughness, we can usually um, quickly generate a metallic map. Um, again, if your surface of choice has metallic components in it, or or has has um, uh, multiple components in it, some of which being metallic and the others being dielectric. So what I've decided here, in fact, let's just uh, quickly pull up as reference, or you know what, let me just. Again, let me let me drag and drop that into Photoshop here. This is going to be my final metallic map. I'll just put that in my metallic folder here. What I've uh, what, what I'm going with here again the, the same idea as uh, as before. Um, so I'm I'm going to be going with uh, the the painted areas, of course. Right, paint isn't isn't metal, so so that's going to be our um, our areas of zero percent metal. Um, so fully black again. Generally, uh, metal me metallic values are fully fully uh, dielectric or fully metallic. Um, the the only appropriate use of grayscale uh, metal me metallic values are potentially in um, you know areas of like like rust or um, corroded areas, transitions between um, maybe a painted area and a metallic area. But generally speaking, everything should be completely black or completely white. So again, uh, following the same ideas as seen in the roughness texture here, right? The painted areas are not metallic, so they should be, you know, zeros in every channel, a value of uh, you know, zero. And we just, uh, we, we encode that as black on the uh, metallic map and everything else, right? Kind of my underlying metallic layer that can be white and uh, ha have that nice metallic uh, surface in there. So let me just quickly show the approach I would take for this. I won't spend much time on this. Um, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna duplicate these two layers and drag them over. These are my two roughness layers. I'm gonna drag them over to my metallic folder, and let's uh, let's uh, change these a little bit. All right, so um, I'm going to um, I'm gonna be aiming for right uh, metallic kind of underneath. All right, so the 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 underlying surface should be you know t completely metallic. So I'm gonna choose my white color, put a fill underneath there, and for the painted areas, right, which of course are dielectrics, um, let's well, how about we use how about we use a threshold? Um, that's probably the fastest way of getting a pure black um, uh, conversion on on this this gray. I mean, we could probably do some extreme some extremes with like a levels adjustment or something but let's just do uh let's let's just do where is it there's my my threshold um so that just gives me uh a, a conversion you know everything that is is present basically every non-transparent pixel i'm just going to convert that to black so that's a pretty quick and easy way of doing it and keep in mind that i have retained all of these nice imperfections here basically wherever that that paint or wherever that dielectric has been chipped away i want to be seeing the metallic surface underneath so that is going to be important to pay attention to as uh as we uh, as we bring in uh the, the metallic map all right and then well we can finish this off real fast here and uh quickly take a stab at, at maybe some albedo uh colors or some some base color values Again, we're going to take generally the same approach here. 
um, you know, start with the, the, the parts of, uh, you know, your PBR maps that you already have created, right? Again, focusing in on these, these painted areas. Um, I, I know that I'm going to want to assign a certain color to those. Let's see, what did I do in my eventual, in my eventual albedo map here? Let me drag and drop that in to Photoshop. And there it is. Put that in my albedo folder. So I ended up going with like a darker paint on the, uh, you know, these, these panels here. Um, but I don't know, for, for the sake of, uh, you know, we've been doing everything grayscale so far to actually introduce some color in here. Uh, let's, how about we make the, the painted panels red? Let's, let's, let's eyedropper that red color there that I was using. Hide that for a second and just take a stab at, at how we would uh, perhaps approach that. So, well, you know what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to take my, um, my layers from the metallic map. I'm going to copy them, bring them over to my albedo folder again. And uh, let's, let's see here. So how about we go with a, a gray base color for underneath, right? For metals, you can, you can use the albedo to kind of adjust the, the basic uh, brightness of, of the metal. It's kind of the only appropriate use of your diffuse channel for metallic areas, right? Because of course, everything else is gonna be, or all your color information is coming from specular reflections, right? Um, but we can adjust kind of like the base, um, the, the, uh, the base brightness using the albedo. And then um, I'm gonna use this, uh, right? The, 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 the black layer originally coming from the metallic map. I'm gonna use this just as a mask to give me a selection to, well, give me my, my red color fill on. So actually I lost my, my color there. So let's just eyedropper that again. And I will con hold control and just click within the thumbnail for my black layer here. Um, if you have never done this before in Photoshop, um, it, you're holding control and clicking on the thumbnail gives you a selection for any opaque pixel. So pretty handy. You can see it's, it's uh, included all of the nice little, you know, these, these imperfections that we've painted in. These are all included in the selection. I'm just going to do a solid color fill uh, with, with this red color. And there it is, right? Uh, so those have all been added in real nicely, right? We have, we have that red paint as our albedo color added in uh, for anywhere where that paint should be. Right, so hopefully that goes over the whole process. Just all the things you have to keep in mind, you know, keeping all your material types together, switching back and forth between your different maps. You know, if you make a change to one, you got to keep in mind how does it affect the others, um, and uh, and and just keeping track of things like that. Uh, save your Photoshop file. Uh, keep all of this together. It's it's very handy to have all of those albedo maps uh, together in the same PSD, export what you need, when you need it, uh, load all the maps into Maya, and then go ahead and give it a render, right? So we can quickly just go through the rest of it, right? If I, uh, oops, we should add in a new, new file node. Um, this is going to be for my metallic map. So let's just uh, call that up quickly. Let's bring in my metallic texture here. And this is this is another one where we need to go and grab just the just the R channel and connect that into metalness. Switch over the color space to raw. And uh, we're probably not going to see too many changes here when we render it, but uh, actually actually quite a bit of oh yeah uh, yeah I darkened my sky dome slightly so we're gonna see basically the absence of light coming through here again uh, all of the uh, you know uh, light bounces off the metallic areas are going to be fully specular um, so uh, so the absence of brightness coming from the sky dome is going to be be coming through here and cause the background to be darker uh, so there's that that makes it a bit more obvious uh, the difference between this underlying metallic layer and the painted layer on top. And let's hit uh, stop on the Arnold render for a second here. Set in one more file node. 
And um, this time we're going to be bringing in our albedo. So let's just, let's just go and grab that. Here's our albedo texture. Um, this one we leave as sRGB. Your albedo texture is an sRGB image, or, or it should be treated as an sRGB image. And of course, we're expecting color vectors. We are not expecting, uh, you know, single grayscale values. So the whole out color vector value, this is going to get piped into your base color. And, uh, and that will get that connected in properly. And here we go. Here's my original uh, albedo map that I loaded in here, right, with the original color values. And th this really is a different uh, kind of tutorial, right, where I'm not doing everything step by step. We're really just showing uh, the general workflow that we use to accomplish this sort of thing. Um, well, at least manually, right, with, with just Photoshop and Maya. Um, there are uh, more sophisticated ways, definitely more sophisticated ways of doing this, again, in software like Substance or uh, Mixer or, or, or that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, generally, this is a, a, a fairly approachable way with limited software, the the minimum software possible to create um, a trim sheet, right? And uh, yeah, so so after after going through that process, um, it simply becomes a matter of taking a look at different assets. Maybe we'll maybe we'll uh, just kind of zero in on one of these bunker assets that. I was previously working on and just thinking to yourself, well, hmm, how, how do I want to uh, use my, the details in my trim sheet to texture individual components here, right? So maybe just let's try and do this. All right, so I had, you know, I had some panels, uh, it's right? Just zeroing in on, on one of these details here, I had some panels on the outside, so I assigned my kind of the, the painted panel section to that. Then I had some pipes up here. Um, so there would be a, a uh, you know, a, U, a UV shell for this cylindrical area. In fact, let me switch right over to my UV editor and uh, just show, well, well, there it is, right? There's uh, th these are all of my these are all of my little cylindrical areas here. Uh, this one is all the way over here, right? Another little detail there. And well, because my trim sheet tiles horizontally, I don't have to worry about exceeding the zero to one space. I can just line everything up, um, have it tile as expected, and uh, just you know, just have those textures applied to the model. Um, all right. Um, in, in fact, let's finish off um, now in the in, in textured and lit mode. Um, I find that the I find that the AI standard surface uh, materials generally don't um, come across super well in the viewport. I mean, it, it's OK, usable. Uh, but if if you find that using your uh, your textured and your lit mode, um, uh, so your six and uh, seven on the keyboard, if you want the keyboard shortcut, if you want to use this for previewing how the model is going to look with the trim sheet applied, again, you, you might want a different solution than visualizing the AI standard surface material. So let me show you a trick I usually do when I'm doing this, right? So what I do is I just go ahead and assign a, a good old Lambert. Um, and head over to that Lambert. It is just clean up our workspace a little bit here. Um, it's currently called Lambert 5. Um, but what I'm going to be interested in is just adding the, you know, w one of the uh, PBR maps. And I'm going to go with the Albedo map just because it, well, you know, after I've added in all the painted components and the grungy components, you know, generally I know what I'm looking for. Uh, when looking at the albedo map. So, you know, I'll just quickly go and bring that in. So there's my albedo. And I find that using the, the Lambert 
uh, just is a lot easier to visualize what's going on, right? I'm sure that comes across uh, in comparison to the other uh, the 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 other uh, assets with the AI standard surface on it. So using this, right, we can very easily go in here and make some changes. So we were we were just talking about some of those um, those those little cylindrical parts there. Let's say I didn't want the uh, the painted stripes on those. Let's say I wanted a different detail. I could just go and grab all those. I'll just grab these three for the sake of demonstration and move them down here. How about, right? And again, I'm not worried about overlaps. This is, right, we're, 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 using, we're, we're using details present on the trim sheet as many times as we want. As long as our, you know, whatever seams we have on the geometry itself, as long as those are hidden correctly, um, and, you know, previously when you would have studied UV mapping, you'll, you'll know how to do that, right? Um, we are going to, uh, we're just going to freely use whatever part of the uh, trim sheet makes sense, right? So maybe here's another, um, maybe here is another piece. This, this happens to be the panel on the right-hand side over here. I can see this updating live as I work on it. Uh, well, maybe, maybe I want, maybe I want a different red stripe on that. Well, how about I go ahead and use this red stripe down here, and uh, just take a look and see how that looks. All right, so uh, that is the entire process. That is how to approach right creating the geometry for baking down to a normal map. Again, mainly relevant for you know hard surface details like this. Right, if you're uh, if you're working on, you know, maybe maybe stonework or like masonry, something like that, maybe wooden surfaces, you're probably going to be starting with perhaps some a base mesh of some sort and then sculpting it in ZBrush uh, or, or Blender and, uh, you know, getting some nice organic sculpted details in there. And, and that's what you would be baking down to a normal map, right? In, in, in this case, right, it's, it's hard surface metallic things, right? So really not, um, th there isn't much use for sculpting. If usually in, in, in that sort of uh, design language. Um, so, so we went through that, looked at how to uh, author uh, some other PBR maps, bring those all into Maya and test out how they look. And uh, all in all, we can, uh, we can end up with some pretty cool looking results. Again, here's some other renders of this uh, simple uh, kind of modular bunker system that I put together uh, as a quick demo for this tutorial right so all all textured using a single set of pbr textures um and ultimately a great optimization method for saving on uh, memory consumption all right so good luck in creating your uh, your your trim sheets and working with those and i'll see you in the next tutorial